Welcome to our very snowy Lord. Pray together. Lord, we bow before you now with uh, thanks in our heart for the beauty of the world you've given us. Uh, a blanket of slow snow creates all kinds of challenges and problems, but it is spectacular to look about when we are safe and snug somewhere. We do pray for those who are out traveling now, watch over them, keep them safe, uh, help us all to make good decisions about our travel. Bless us as we meet together here around the fellowship of your word and with the assistance and support of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in your name. Amen. I want to read our scripture passage for today, which is Acts 4, 32 to chapter 5, verse 11. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to you, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Good morning, church. Good to be with you today. Uh, as we continue in our worship today, would you join us in song? Jesus 
i 
sing how beautiful the cross we have only heard the faintest whispers of how great you are made the world and so gunmen attacked uh, a lunar new year festival in an asian venue and the last i heard uh, 10 people had died many others were injured uh, so we want to for our prayer time today make sure we do recall that and focus on that um, it has like all the appearance of uh, some sort of hate crime and Obviously, as followers of Jesus, we stand 100% opposed to that kind of behavior. We have a Lord that sent us out and said that we are to make disciples of all nations, bringing them together as one people into one body. So none of that foolishness, none of that sort of thinking and racism is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's uh, pray together now and for the community of Monterey Park, California, for the families of those uh, who have lost loved ones for the, uh, as well, pray for the, those who have been injured. Lord, we affirm to you that we do not have hearts that are opposed to yours. When you told us that we would love all the peoples of the world and draw them to be with us, we heard that. And we see in that uh, the beautiful equality that you make among the peoples. They are all created, your creatures, they are created in your image. And in all the different ways of the varieties of our races and nations, they have dignity and value and worth. Lord, we want to pray for Monterey Park, California, for that community, for the losses that they've endured, for the trauma that's been imposed upon them. We pray for the families of those who have been um, murdered. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would help the person who did this to be uh, removed from circulation and to be brought to justice. We pray for those who are injured that you would comfort them, you would help with their recovery and support their families as well. Watch over the first responders who responded with medical care, those who are in law enforcement and doing investigation, those who uh, during this new year season will be elevating protection for Asian venues, 
Lord, support and give strength to all of them. We see in the opposite of who we are a reminder of our calling to be your agents to all the peoples of the world. We feel honored to be your ambassadors and we uh, take that responsibility to a heart with humble dependence upon you. Lord, now, while we've talked about this event that is significant enough to be uh, of national and international attention, there are matters that are very personal for people who are with us here today, either live or virtually. And we want to take time for those matters to be brought to you as your people here are united in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, in this time of intercessory prayer. So in these moments of silence, Lord, may each of us bring to you the matters that are upon our heart with full trust that you hear and heed them. Lord, thank you for who you are, for the ministry of your Holy Spirit that when we join together in prayer, joins us to you in rich and full communion. Glorify yourself now by not, uh, taking our prayers and making the answers to them reality in your universe. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've stated uh, several times uh, in the past few weeks that we've been studying the book of Acts, it's very tempting to want to find a shortcut to the power and impact of that first church, of the church we see in those first few decades. It's all too easy to credit to it to strategies or practices or structures or passions or personalities and then go out and try to duplicate that try to copy those things that were many of them unique to them if we aren't careful what we will miss is the true message of this book that that is the centrality of the Holy Spirit and the extraordinary impact he has on ordinary people who surrender themselves to him. The centrality of the work of the Holy Spirit and the extraordinary impact he has on ordinary people who surrender themselves to him. We miss the importance then of spiritual substance as we go looking for spiritual power. Or as I've stated it in our message summary today, the root comes before the fruit. Being should come before doing. Being should come before doing. The harvest isn't what's first. It's the sowing and the development of uh, first a root system, right? And then a stalk and a plant. And eventually, there is a harvest of a crop, but the root comes before the fruit. Substance comes before the impact. That substance comes, the being comes before doing. As we've gone through the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 21, the Spirit is promised and waited for. Good pattern for our lives, right? The, the Spirit is one of the persons of the Trinity. He is a personal being. He's not a force. He's not an entity. He is a person, and he works with all the complexity of God. And as we seek the Holy Spirit, he delights for us to take our time, to position ourselves before him, to listen for him, to let him speak to us about often small things as he prepares then to anoint us and descend upon us in power. And that's what the church did 
in Acts chapter 1, they were promised the Spirit, they waited for Him. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit was given. You could argue then in the rest of the New Testament, the Spirit is working, but certainly in Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4, the Spirit is working and the world, the flesh, and the devil are pushing back. In Acts uh, chapter 4 and 5, we're nearly a year after this uh, great new experiment has begun that we call the church. And two factors now have produced economic stress on them. Uh, the first factor is that Jesus' message always resonated with the poor. Right? I'm not lying in with uh, Karl Marx who argued that the purpose of religion was to be an opiate of the masses, to make them content with poverty, and that all religion does is allow the poor to be quiet in their suffering and the rich and the wealthy to grow wealthier. But you, you can't miss Old Testament and New Testament, and certainly about Jesus, that the way Jesus was able to convey a message of hope and dignity to every person, no matter how much or how little they had, brought people forth. It's, it's one of the terrible things poverty does is that poverty disempowers people. Poverty as uh, they live in it and they experience that suffering leads them to say, what's, what's wrong with me? Why do others have more than I have? Why are others able to care for themselves and their children? Why am I poor? But Jesus, when he would meet somebody, would cut past all that and he'd never see either their wealth or their poverty and he'd look directly into their soul for whatever it was they needed. And the poor especially resonated to his message and because of that, the church as uh, it was getting started in first century Jerusalem attracted a lot of poor people and they come with their needs, they come with their struggles. There's a second dimension to why uh, the church, this new congregation in Jerusalem was experiencing economic uh, distress and that was that by claiming to follow Jesus as the Messiah, Many people were rejected by their families or were persecuted. They were cut off from family or other institutional benevolences. It would uh, create business pressures for them as they were ostracized for saying, no, I think Jesus is the Messiah. I want to follow him. The result of these pressures was that the church in Jerusalem consisted of a needy people. Uh, that word's actually used in these chapters, and it's a, a unique Greek word that only appears here, and it means impoverished, starving, poor. And so the general principle is that our obligation increases with the desperation of the situation. Uh, now, we're obligated to support life, not lifestyle. It's one of the things when we live in this culture that's so abundant that uh, when we see that these people had needs, they were needs of sustaining their life, of having clothing that would keep them from having hypothermia, of having food that would keep them from uh, becoming malnourished and falling into disease and death. They were desperately poor. Often we'll have friends who get into economic distress and we'll want to bless and help them. We have to always be careful though that uh, they may be going through a season where one of the variables is a reduction in their lifestyle. And the house that they had with they were paying a mortgage on, they can't afford anymore. And now they're going to be uh, living in a more humble place that they're renting. That's part of the ebb and flow of life. And if you want to be generous with those friends, it's not nearly the same you're free to do that, but it's not nearly the same uh, level of obligation that exists when a person's life is at stake. When a person is at risk of dying because they don't have clothing or shelter, when a person is at risk of dying because there's insufficient food. And so as we look at the church in this very difficult situation, 
manifesting incredible spiritual power that we'd love to have for our church today, I want to look at two foundations of it that I'm going to draw from this passage. I'm going to talk briefly about two Greek words. The first foundation is generosity, right? In uh, that passage that we read today, we heard that all the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. The uh, biblical word that's going to appear many times in these early chapters of Acts is the Greek word koinos or koinonia. Koinos or koinonia, often it's translated as fellowship in the New Testament. It's an interesting Greek word because it's very common in the New Testament. It's not very common in the rest of the Greek language. This word koinonia, especially in that form, doesn't appear. And so we have to pay attention to how it's used and from this passage as well. And I, I'm going to suggest to you a definition from it. And that is when it is not who owns something that matters, but who needs something that matters. This is one of the great distortions of our capitalistic system. For all the empowerment it gives us, it can create on, in us a false truth as Christians that what we have is ours. Now, it's nice to know that what we have is ours. It's not the government's. It's nice to know that what we have is ours, and it doesn't forcibly have to be shared with our neighbors. But w the idea that what you have is yours and you can do with it anything you want, which is kind of a definition of capitalism, is not biblical. What the Bible says is that what I have, what you have, is God's. And we're obligated to do with it that which he calls us to use it for. And that's kind of the root of koinonia, that the things that we have that um, most societies, certainly capitalistic societies, say is ours, is God's. And then when you see someone who is in need, not somebody who is in want, not somebody who's experiencing the consequences of irresponsibility that, that doesn't really threaten their existence in any significant way, but when somebody is in true need, then it's not, it doesn't matter so much that I own it, it matters very much that God has given it to me to be a steward of it. In this passage, there's one guy that knows this very well. This is Barnabas. He's uh, of uh, the priestly tribe. He's a Levite. He's probably wealthy because uh, of the way Jewish society in that day in Jerusalem was structured. The temple was the driving economic engine of the economy of Jerusalem. People would come and they would have to uh, exchange their money so that they could use money that didn't have the image of the Roman Empire on it and they had to uh, go, and that exchange rate would benefit the institution of the temple they would have to get sacrifices uh, always as allowed by the Torah some of those sacrifices were set aside for the use to the of the Levites and the priests and as uh, Jews from around the world were coming there some of the most elegant mansions that we excavate in Jerusalem from that day belong to the priesthood, the Sadducees and the Levites. And so uh, it's, if we find out that Barnabas had property and had some means of wealth, that is no surprise because the priesthood of that day was powerfully enriched. It, it was one of the things that upset Jesus about the Sadducees. Sometimes we think it's a doctrinal conflict with them, but the idea that they were willing to enrich themselves while people were starving, while people who were coming to worship were impoverished by even the act of worship, it infuriated Jesus. The fact that they had taken over the uh, court of the Gentiles 
and a place where in the very design of the temple there was going to be a place where Gentiles could come and worship the God of the universe and because the Sadducees devalued the Gentiles so much they set up their exchange tables and that's when Jesus overthrew them and he said my father's house shall be a house of prayer we usually stop there but it's a quote from Isaiah and the full quote is for all nations Jesus was furious with the Sadducees for enriching themselves by excluding others and so Barnabas uh, took and shared what he had and made sure that it helped the starving people of that church. Now, the story went on, if you listen carefully, and there was uh, another couple that were a couple of some means. They owned property, right? Uh, in Galilee at the time of Jesus, 80% of the population in Galilee, uh, Jerusalem was a little uh, more affluent, but 80% of the population uh, in Galilee lived at a subsistence level. That means whatever they earned or whatever they grew or whatever they tended in their flocks was just enough to feed them. It wasn't enough to have any margin to advance economically. They were in a survival on the edge of starvation where one catastrophe to their fields, one catastrophe to their flocks, one catastrophe to their livelihood would mean that their family could be plunged into poverty, starvation, and death. 80% of Galilee. So that's the kind of world it is. So when we see Ananias and Sapphira having disposable investment real estate, we realize that, that they are people of some means. And so I suggested to you that one of the foundations of the early church's supernatural power was an understanding of koinonia. It was generosity. It was understanding that what I have isn't mine, it's God's. And I am responsible. And that's one of the ways capitalism can help Christians is it it can empower us in the control of our resources to use it then for God's purposes. And so this generosity was one of the foundations that unleashed supernatural power in the church. But there was another, and we learn it from Ananias and Sapphira. And here I'm going to deal with the Greek word anhypocritos. You can hear in there our English word hypocrite, and the first syllable an is a... Um, negative suffix and it means not a hypocrite and this is a place where we see that when who we really are is in line with who we claim to be we claim to be a Christian then within our heart there is a love and devotion to Jesus Christ we uh, claim to serve God then in our heart and then in our life there is time of serving God it's when what's inside matches what we say with our mouth right so so our professions are in line with our character Ananias and Sapphira didn't fall over dead because and by the way it doesn't say that God struck them down. It says that they fell dead. We don't know what dynamics took place within them. We don't know whether fear, grief, shame, terror over being caught lying to God. We don't know the dynamics of what happened, but we know that they died not because they kept back some of the money. It was because they were lying. They were deceiving. They, who they were inside wasn't consistent with what they were saying. And at this time of purity in the church, it was so incongruent that somehow, through some mechanism, they died. Integrity, as we're using here, doesn't mean that the inside is perfect. It just means that the inside matches our profession that the inside matches what we say 
And in this case, so that the spiritual substance of generosity, the spiritual substance of integrity come from within. The root comes before the fruit. Being should come before doing. Your being doesn't have to be perfect. And neither does the image you present to people have to be perfect. If you want to live at peace with integrity, keep those two together. Let the profession of your mouth be in accord with whatever work God has accomplished in you. Be willing to say, you know, I realize I should be more active in that area. I'm not yet. I'm afraid. Or I am uh, find myself consumed with worry over my career or my income. And so it doesn't, I can't uh, be free to do this in this area. And, all those things, I care about what people think, so I don't really apply myself in that area. The inside doesn't have to be perfect. In God's world, for us to have integrity, the inside and the outside must match, which means all of us, right? The Bible says all of sin falls short of the glory of God. We have to have a certain humility about uh, how we present ourselves and a humbleness. It's why Jesus said, don't go around judging other people, right? Because that judgment's going to be applied to you. You're not the perfect God of the universe judging others. You're an imperfect, flawed person as well. So leave the judgment on the shelf and apply it to God. Well, quickly then, what is the result of uh, this kind of living? What is the result of having a church where people are generous, they practice koinonia, where they have integrity, they're ah-hypocritical from uh, the sense of the Greek word that's used. There's two results. There's, first of all, supernatural power. And I uh, quit reading at verse 11 in chapter 5, but I could go on and you'd read this. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's portico. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more women and men believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And so here we have these two things that we'd love to have in our church, right? We'd love to have more supernatural power than when somebody we care about is struggling emotionally or somebody we're caring about has a serious sickness that we would call upon the Lord and we'd see a supernatural power unlocked. We'd love to have more of that unleashed in our church. And then the fact that the witness is fruitful of the church, the witness is uh, effective and what? More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to the number. We'd love to have that. But we've got to pay attention to the fact that the root comes before the fruit, that being comes before doing, and that our generosity and our integrity, our view that what I have is God's and he is to direct me to what I do with it, it's not who owns it that matters, it's who needs it that matters, as well as the fact that we want who we really are, integrity, inside, to match the claims we make at outside. When that happens in a believer's life, and let's just go to the individual, God's spirit and power on, are more unleashed to flow through him or her. When it happens in a church, it is the same way as well. Generosity and integrity. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow before you now and we surrender ourselves to your spirit. Sometimes we have the idea that it's like pulling into the gas station and opening the tank and turning on the pump, putting it in, and we are charged full. But the maintenance of the vehicle, what's going on in our hearts, in our spiritual lives, determines the degree to which any power is unleashed for the supernatural impact of prayer in our world or for effective witness. And so, Lord, we would be remiss if we were not people who come to you and say, 
grow us. By your spirit first, build spiritual substance in our lives so that profound and meaningful and kingdom building spiritual fruit would result. Lord, it's no surprise your whole universe is set this way that the root comes before the fruit, that being comes before doing. Help us internalize that lesson and live it in the power of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.